Good morning and welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series, Maximizing Lifelong Brain Health in MS. Today's topic is mood disorders dealing with the emotional impact of multiple sclerosis. Our presenters for today's webinar are Dr. Augusto Mirabali, an MS specialty neurologist at the Rocky Mountain MS Center Clinic at CU Hospital's Anschutz Medical Campus. Patricia Daly, a licensed clinical social worker with more than 20 years experience treating MS patients and their families, and Anne-Marie Puderbaugh, an MS patient advocate and patient at the Rocky Mountain MS Center Clinic at the Anschutz Medical Campus. The webinar is scheduled for about one hour. The first 45 minutes will be a presentation and discussion by our panel, and the last portion will be reserved for questions from the audience. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation by entering it in the chat window you see on your screen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Now here's Anne-Marie to get us started. Good morning. Um, I was happy to be uh, involved in this webinar today. I was diagnosed with MS uh, about six years ago and actually had symptoms for about nine months before that. And when we first talked about the topic today, my reaction was that the phrase mood disorders wasn't something that I really identified with or that resonated with me. And I think that's because when I feel what I feel having MS and uh, in, this, in this area, I tend to use other words. I think of being irritable. Um, many people I know with MS would describe it as being depressed or anxious. And a lot of what I went through when I was diagnosed was complete shock. And so mood disorder feels kind of a remote phrase for me and something kind of impersonal and, and not something that um, I really identify with. But all these other things are ways I feel um, day, day in or day out. And I think what I do identify with is I have this disease. I have multiple sclerosis and uh, I have symptoms. And so to have a disorder on top of that, it just isn't something that I think about. But I think what we're going to talk about today um, will kind of bring it all together the way we feel and a lot of the um, supporting information behind it that helps us understand how we feel, even though we as MS patients might describe it differently and feel it differently. So I was diagnosed six years ago, and like I said, it took about nine months to get the diagnosis. Um, it was a complete nightmare just getting to the diagnosis. I was very fearful that I had something much, much worse um, or just different. I really didn't know if it was worse or not because I wasn't familiar with, with uh, multiple sclerosis or any of the other things I feared. And um, when I finally got the diagnosis, I had been in what I now know was a flare-up for two months. Um, I had just about every symptom you could have. Um, my legs had um, gone numb. My arms had gone numb. I was sleeping 12 hours a day with my fatigue. Um, I couldn't remember things at work. Um, and it was just overwhelming. I really felt like I was falling apart. So when I got the diagnosis, I was completely in, in shock. Um, I was terrified. I didn't know what my future held. Um, there was complete uncertainty. I had a two-year-old um, at the time, and I didn't know if I'd be able to go hiking again, if I'd be able to pick her up, um, because when I when I did get diagnosed, I was very, very sick. Um, I worked full-time and even very heavy full-time um, and was married and um, just really couldn't cope with, with any of it. Um, and I immediately started just grieving a life that I felt I had lost just in a matter of one day, one moment, really. I was overwhelmed physically, as I said. I, oh, I didn't mention I had leg drag as well as having my legs and my arms um, go numb on many occasions. 
And so when I got diagnosed, I had leg drag as well. I had high sensitivity to light, so I was trying to hide everything when I went to work. Um, so I was just overwhelmed physically. I was overwhelmed emotionally with trying to understand what I was going through and what was ahead of me. And I was overwhelmed psychologically, um, not knowing who I was anymore, if I would be able to be a good wife, if I'd be able to be a good mom, if I'd be able to keep working. Um, and so I just isolated myself um, because I, I didn't have the energy to deal with what anyone else was going through because I didn't have the energy to go through what I was going through because I was so sick. And, and now I needed more energy than ever to deal with all, all of what I was going through. Um, I learned very quickly that some people give energy, but many, many others take energy. And so isolating myself was one of the only ways that, that I could cope. And most people are, that were important in my life didn't understand that, but I didn't care. <laughs> um, because it was at that point it was just pure survival for me. Um, so I, I couldn't cope, and I would absolutely say I was depressed <laughs> at that time. Um, that was a word I would definitely use. But I would also say that it was so much more than that. I mean, it was an absolutely terrifying, life-changing moment and event. And so depression almost, that was just part of, of what I was going through. And I think it's important to mention, too, um, that my husband was very depressed as well. Um, and, you know, his future, as he expected, you know, we all think we're in control. And it's something that, you know, we expected we knew what our future might hold, and, and it just all changed. And I still remember when I got my diagnosis, um, he and I just sat and cried. And we both knew everything was going to be different. Um, and I had a two-year-old, and, and in her own way, she showed her struggles. Um, she would walk by my door when I had to be by myself and alone and in the dark because of migraines, and she would just scream and pound on the door and cry, I want my mommy, and I couldn't be around her. So um, my journey began once I got that diagnosis, and... Um, one of the first things that helped me was I saw a counselor who I cried to for an hour straight. <laughs> and I think that's when I realized I was depressed. <laughs> Before that, I was trying to handle it all and be strong as I'd been in the past. Um, and for others, um, I had to be strong. But I finally had a chance to not have to be strong, and I let it all out. And the counselor realized the stage I was at, which I didn't, which was I was going through trauma, a really traumatic time for me. And so we talked about how antidepressants uh, might help, and I've never taken antidepressants prior, and um, it wasn't, I generally don't like to have to take medications, even antibiotics, if, if I can avoid them. Um, but I didn't question it after I sat and cried for an hour. <laughs> I said, I'll, I'll try anything that might help me um, get through this a little more easily. And so um, I spoke with my neurologist next, um, and, uh, and actually was just getting to know this is a new neurologist, not the person who diagnosed me. And so um, I started taking some antidepressants. And I also started with weekly counseling because I realized if I could cry for an hour, I could probably cry for a lot longer and eventually I'd be able to talk about it. Um, and so through counseling and starting to live my new life, you know, as I was, I call this kind of my adjustment phase, um, I, uh, I started developing a new routine. And part of it included the fact that I had chronic fatigue so I had to sleep, I, I, as most of you probably know, it wasn't a choice, but I had to sleep. My body shut down for a couple hours every day, and so I could no longer work. And based on what I could do in my personal life, even those responsibilities had to change. So um, 
I used to run a $200 million line of business for my work, and um, after making two really significant personal financial errors, within weeks of being diagnosed, my husband and I agreed that I wasn't going to touch any of the finances <laughs> anymore. Um, and that was a relief for me. Um, and it was pretty scary that I could even make the mistakes that I made and not realize it um, until days later when the memory came back that, oh, I think I put that in the wrong account. Um, and then the other thing I, I did after I stabilized a bit was I, I started, well, actually, I did this right from the beginning. I started exercising very slowly in the beginning, very gentle yoga, and then I did more and, um, and more, and that helped me. Initially, I needed to do exercise by myself because I still wasn't ready to be around people very much. But once I got stronger, I felt that I, I liked the energy of being around other people, and so I started exercising um, in some group classes, and, and that was very, very helpful for me in, during my adjustment. And then the other big aspect of helping to get stronger during my adjustment phase was I, I stumbled upon um, someone who had MS, and it ended up she had two friends with MS, previous coworkers, and they met once a month, and they asked me to join them. And so over the past six years, that has helped me immensely. Um, it's social. We get together for dinner. Um, we keep meeting others through our family, friends, colleagues, network of people. Um, and sometimes we talk about MS or, uh, you know, medications or neurologists or um, this pain or that pain. Um, and other times we don't talk about it at all because we're friends and it's, it's a little different than a support group where it's not based on all those deep friendships. Um, and the comparison I make to that group for me, for any of the women who've been pregnant, is when there's a sisterhood when you're pregnant. Um, you're all going through the same thing and no matter how much a man or a woman who hasn't been pregnant wants to relate, you simply can't because you haven't lived through it. And I think that's what's different about my, my friends with MS. Um, and that is a very safe and comfortable place to be, and, and it's great to have that support. So after my adjustment phase, I call it my living phase, my living with MS. And I felt that I'd adapted to my new normal, and um, so I talked to my counselor and I talked to my doctor about um, stopping the antidepressants. I knew that, um, you know, depression can be a symptom of MS, but I also knew um, that I had been through a really traumatic period of time, and I wanted to see what I was like not on, uh, not on antidepressants. And I should maybe mention now here, um, the reason I knew those things is because um, I spent a very long time, probably about a year, um, getting very educated about uh, what this was, my, my new friend in my life, um, <laughs> what this was that I had to live with. And so understanding that about depression, that it could be a symptom as well as a reaction to a really difficult time, I wanted to see if I had this symptom. So I went off it, and um, after about three months, I realized, wow, <laughs> I really don't like very much who I am, not with the help of the antidepressants. Um, and, and again, I, this is someone who didn't like medication, um, but the irritability, and that's the word that I would use to describe m myself, you know, going through my emotional swings. It was more irritability than I felt depression or anxiety. I, I, I feel like, you know, a mood disorder almost sounds like um, I'm in a bad mood because the grocery line is too long, and it's something I should be able to easily and quickly change. And 
this came and stayed, and it was the irritability was familiar because I had it um, even before I got diagnosed. It was just something I didn't realize was associated with uh, my MS, and so. I just found I didn't like how I treated others. I'd snap at my two-year-old and then feel really bad that I was just not being patient. And, um, and I didn't like, I'd, I'd do the same thing to my husband and I would even do it to strangers, like you know, a, a cashier at a store and then I'd get in the car. And I would just feel ugly and disappointed in myself and how I treated other people. And I know that it all tied together with my fatigue, which I had every day. And it was kind of like a, an inverse bell curve where it wasn't just I needed to go to sleep and then I'd wake up and feel great. There was kind of this steady decline into the fatigue and a, a slow um, fog coming out of the fatigue. And it was also tied with the frustration of me being limited. So I was time limited now because I had to sleep a few hours. But I was also limited that I couldn't do the work I used to do. I couldn't have some of the responsibilities I'd had in the past. Um, and I also got really overwhelmed with stimuli, and so all those things would make me so irritable, no matter how much I didn't want to want to be. And so after three months, I asked to go back on the antidepressants. Um, my life evened out again. I continued counseling through all this period, which was very helpful. And I just realized I wanted to ease others' pain after my life evened out. Um, by what I've learned and what I've been through. And so after I feel like I was back to a stable, <laughs> routine, new normal living with MS, um, I started volunteering. And I'm very open with my MS, so I tend to meet a lot of people who have MS um, because I am quite open about it. So. Um, that's kind of my story. I, I guess I would just say that I don't know where I would be without counseling, without the antidepressant medication, without my MS friends and family, and my friends who don't have MS. So thank you for, for listening to me and letting me share my story. So this is Pat Daly speaking. Um, the topic of our seminar today is Mood Disorders in MS, and, but mostly we're talking about different kinds of depression. Depression is kind of an umbrella term. There are different ways that depression manifests, um, and so when we talk about mood disorders, primarily we're talking about depressive mood disorders. And why is this important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons, but the biggest reason it's important is that the presence of depression is the best predictor of a diminished quality of life for people living with MS, and it beats out physical symptoms hands down. So living with MS, because it's a chronic illness, is a marathon, and people have to have the energy to stay in the game, and depression can certainly drain your energy. 60% of people with MS, it's estimated, and those estimates vary, um, will experience a major depression in, at some point in the course of their illness. And the incidence of major depression in MS and transverse myelitis beats out other chronic diseases, and it beats out the general non-MS population where the incidence of depression is between 5 and 15%. So there's a lot of depression that people with MS experience. The other thing that's important about depression is that, for reasons that I think Anne Marie touched on, it's underreported, it's underdiagnosed, and it's undertreated. So people often don't know that they have this. It often doesn't get identified when you see your doctor, because there's a lot going on when you see your doctor. Um, and if nobody knows you have it, and if you don't report it, you're not likely to treat it. And the other important thing to remember about depression is that it is not correlated with physical impairment. So that's another reason I think that people don't recognize sometimes that they have MS because they can be doing, or they don't recognize that they have depression, excuse me, because they can be, be doing physically pretty well and be mystified by the fact that they feel dreadful. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Miravalli. Thank you, Pat, and, and thank you, Anne-Marie, for that wonderful story. Um, so the, the next few slides are intended to 
present to the audience three different cases. Um, the goal for these cases is to get a sense of what the audience uh, is familiar with, the diagnosis of depression. So at the end of each case, we will have uh, a question which we will be asking the audience to poll uh, which of the three cases uh, it represents a patient with a depression. Um, so the first case is a 35-year-old woman that for two years has been having progressive sense of difficulty enjoying things in life. Um, she was never manifested any, any attempts of suicide or even thoughts of suicide. However, she continued to be increasingly dissatisfied with everything she had around. Uh, she experienced frustration and, and she was angry about pretty much everything happened around her and at the same time had this sense of fatigue and, and being on a fog and sleeping actually over 10 hours per day. So this is the first, the first patient. Let's move on to the second case which is a, um, let's see if I can scroll it here, here we go, it's John. He's a healthy 42-year-old professional. He, he has a very demanding and high-stress job. He's an attorney and he always been a high achiever and he graduated with top honors in college and law school. Uh, despite his high standards, at some point he became um, having thoughts of uh, worthlessness and, and he had this guilt sensation, shame for, for uh, inability to accomplish his high expectations. Uh, for the past few weeks, uh, John was found to work over 16 hours per day, which was significantly more than what he used to do before, and he, uh, to the expense of sleeping less than six hours per day. At the same time, he reports difficulty concentrating, uh, he lost weight, and he became irritable with his coworkers and his uh, environment. And the last case is Kristen, a 38-year-old divorced mother of two teenagers, uh, again, very successful. She had a career in the past. However, she started to become uh, concerned and, and express a sensation of being worried about pretty much everything she had in her life and became very negative. She had negative thoughts about her future, uh, her, her family, her kids, and this constant sense of fear. At some point, that evolved into being restless, tired, and tense again, very readable. She found herself to, in occasions, in meetings and, and social environments, to lose track of conversations. And, and at some point, uh, she had this sensation of overwhelming um, sense of the brain will never stop and won't shut off. Um, of course, that has significant impact on her uh, social and work environment. So I guess at this point, we would like to know what the audience feel which of the three patients um, you will feel that has depression? And you might want to select one, two, or three of them, depending on how comfortable you feel that these patients may suffer from depression. So we will allow a few minutes for the audience to choose their preferred answer. So we have a little bit over 60% of the audience answering, and it's an overwhelming 94% uh, of the audience felt that Carla, the first patient, uh, suffers from depression, 85% felt that John suffers from depression, and 60% Kristen. Well, I think uh, it, it, we all agree that the three uh, answers are correct, so three patients actually have depression. Uh, and we thought to present these three cases because they represent different ways in which patients can experience the signs and symptoms of depression. So I will let uh, Pat take over from here to uh, illustrate more on, on this, this aspect that is very important. So we all know that everybody with MS experiences MS differently, and everybody with depression does the same. Depression looks different on everybody who has it, and you can't tell by looking at someone, really whether or not they're depressed. Um, and I think that it's important also to note two things at this point about the people around you. One is that when you have MS, um, the people around you also have MS. 
although they don't have the symptoms of the disease, they kind of have secondhand MS. And so all of the stresses and strains that we talk about affecting the person with MS can have an impact on the people around you. So mood disorders aren't just limited to the person who physically has the disease. Um, and I think it's important to recognize and remember that MS affects other people in your world as well. Um, and another important point is that sometimes the people around you are a much better mirror and source of information about how you're actually doing than you yourself are. So sometimes the people around you are the, can be very helpful in helping you recognize that, that you have something going on with you, like a mood disorder. So I said earlier that MS is underreported, underdiagnosed. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. We have the next slide. Yeah. Um, depression in MS has a lot of different causes. It is caused, can be caused by the disease process itself. It can be a symptom of the disease. It can be secondary to medication. It is certainly a consequence of having and having to live and manage a chronic stressful disease. Um, so MS can. Depression in MS can come from a lot of different places. Um, I think when people think about depression, a lot of times what they look at are the formal diagnostic criteria for depression. And when they look at the formal diagnostic criteria for depression, they look at it and they say, well, that's not me. Um, a lot of people don't really know what psychomotor agitation or retardation actually really is. Um, and so, but if you look at the major diagnostic criteria for depression, um, it just doesn't register with people. So I think there's a huge difference and one of the important points that we want to make in this discussion is that um, there's a huge difference between how depression looks on paper and the lived experience of a mood disorder in MS. So I'm going to let Augusto take over and talk about actually what we see and look for in clinic. Absolutely. So thank you, Pat. And, and that, that's correct. So uh, if, if, if there is a, a message that I would like to convey in this opportunity is that regardless of labels, regardless of, of, of names that doctors will place on signs and symptoms, the important here piece of that is a, have an honest conversation with yourself, with your family members, and with your physicians and the team around you to understand what is happening to you and, and may or may not fit certain diagnostic criteria, but that's okay. There is always something that yourself and your environment can do to help you. So this slide tried to summarize what are um, the, the key features of depression and mood disorders in general in MS. So depression is one of the many uh, mood disorders that MS patients can experience through all their um, disease. And of course, if for the reasons that Pat explained, whether it's a disease process itself, whether it's a reaction to the disease, the consequence of medications, MS individuals are at increased risk of emotional disorders. Um, it, it also could result in a significant burden uh, on the quality of life for patients and their environments, their family. Um, and MS patients are at, at, as twice as likely to commit suicide than non-MS patients. So, this is the first point that is important. Depression is a fatal disease, and that's something that we really uh, feel comfortable talking to, but it, it is a reality. In terms of uh, what we know of the incidence and prevalence, uh, up to 80% of patients uh, with MS will experience depressive symptoms at some point in their life. Uh, that could be in the, in the way of grieving for losses. Uh, there is this acute uh, depression that could overcome a chronic underlying depression. Every crisis in life in a patient with MS, whether it is divorce, a new job, a loss of a family member, will manifest with, manifest with another event of acute depression. And that's something that is usually very difficult to distinguish between the chronic underlying depression that patients may already have experienced. Uh, there is also anxiety and generalized stress disorders that is very commonly seen in MS patients. Um, it's mood swings, uh, seasonal affective disorders, which ha have to be very common in, in the wintertime, and probably that's the reasons why we agreed to do this webinar uh, in the middle of January in the mountains, because that could be something that, in addition to uh, depression in MS, uh, patients may experience a, an, a, 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 an underlying uh, seasonal affective disorder as well. 
So the next slides I will probably uh, glance through very quickly, but uh, going back to the, what Pat was trying to make, the point of what she was making is that we do have criteria. That doesn't mean that patients, if they don't meet these criteria, they, they are not depressed. But these criteria help us to try to understand the extent of, of the symptoms and how much that's impacting their life. So there, those are examples, guilt, that's very commonly seen, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, thoughts of suicide, appetite which is increased or decreased, uh, insomnia or hypersomnia, so sleeping little or sleeping too much, and retardation or agitation, being slow or feeling slow or feeling too actually fast. When you talk about psychomotor agitation, some of that can be things that you wouldn't think about that way, like someone who's working 16 hours a day. That can kind of be this drive to just keep moving and keep doing. We don't typically think of it in those terms. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I usually uh, explain to patients the, the concept of the brain being like a computer, and you, so, you have the software and you have the hardware, and they could both be uh, affected by, by the disease, and, and the software will be the way things function, and, and, and MS will affect that as, as well, but depression also affects, so whether they function too slow or too fast, uh, as we all know when we have problems with computers, Either one could result in the computer to crash and, and things don't happen the way we want. And that brings frustration and irritability, which makes things actually worse. So to move on on the symptoms, well, a patient can experience any of these symptoms. And pretty much every function in life, uh, whether it's social interactions or interactions with, with your own self, could be affected. Uh, Self-esteem, for example, is a very uh, usual uh, symptom that physicians, we are not good at trying to uh, talk to patients about that, and, and that's something that might be missed during the encounters. Uh, what are the behaviors that depression can result in? Well, as we mentioned, uh, uh, psychomotor agitation or slow uh, neglect uh, of appearance, uh, poor memory, difficulty concentrating and difficulty making decisions. And Anne-Marie uh, mentioned in her, in her story uh, of the financial burden and, and making difficult, you know, difficult judgments in terms of many aspects. And it's this concept of the cognitive impact that depression may have. Uh, even though Anne-Marie is a highly intelligent person, very accomplished in finances in the past, having depression may somehow blunt that, uh, that high skill ability that she has to make decisions. Um. I wanted to toss in something here about suicidal thoughts because that's something that most people don't relate to particularly having, but that can include just spending a whole lot of time thinking about planning your own funeral. It doesn't have to be a conscious thought about harming yourself. It can be kind of just thinking that you don't have a future and thinking that there's nothing there for you. That counts. Absolutely. And if I could add one other thing, I think one of the difficulties of trying to um, recognize if you're depressed or not, and if that's something that you know you you would how you would describe yourself, is some of these behavioral changes can be similar to the actual MS symptoms. So that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean the um, you know for instance. A lot of times I won't shower first thing in the morning because I know I'm going to have to sleep in the afternoon. <laughs> so I'll, I'll plan to shower in the afternoon. And so you might, so someone might say, you know, maybe you're not as worried about your appearance. Well, there's a logic to that. But there are other times when you just get up and you don't have it in you and you don't feel like doing it and you just don't care. And I think um, being able to separate those or the memory. I have all kinds of cognitive um, issues now. And um, so, you know, I just simply can't remember things, um, and I have difficulty concentrating, and all those are MS symptoms, but they're, they feel different when you're depressed, and I think it's, it's hard to, I can say that now, but it's hard to call that out, I think, without someone like my husband holding that mirror up at times, or having my counselor help me walk through the journey of, of how I'm feeling and how those behaviors are manifesting. Absolutely, and that, that's, that's exactly true. And just to summarize what we've been talking here, uh, there's this vicious cycle of depression that we don't know what, what started things. And, and 
but people that go through depression, as we mentioned before, that could impact sleep and that could result in fatigue, whether it's fatigue related to depression itself or fatigue as a consequence of not sleeping well. And, and that fatigue can result in difficulty concentrating and with this uh, a negative impact on cognitive skills. It's not that patients are no longer smart. I mean, that has absolutely nothing to do with higher cognitive skills. Is that going back to the software problem, there are too many things happening that is actually not allowing patients to function at the extent of their maximal potential. And that results also in difficulty with memory. And of course, if you can imagine going through all this cycle, you will be irritable. That's not your fault. It's not a, 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 a dysfunctional response that you have to things. It's just normal. That's a normal consequence of this cycle. So regardless of what started here, it's important to somehow stop this cycle, whether it's by impacting on sleep, on fatigue, on concentration, depression. No matter where you start intervention, this cycle will get better. So, um, I think mood disorders can look different depending on where you are in the cycle of MS. Uh, and so, I think when I think about people who are newly diagnosed, can you keep going? Yeah. Uh, people who are dealing with the diagnosis of MS may look different than and the depression that they have looks different than the depression of someone who's had MS for, oh, four or five years. When people are dealing with the diagnosis, and I think it's important to stress throughout here, we talk about mood disorders as if somebody's doing something wrong, but in fact, uh, having an emotional response to a traumatic life event is what we expect people to have, and we would be actually more concerned about people who didn't have any kind of an emotional reaction to getting diagnosed with MS, because we kind of wonder if they actually heard what we were saying or if they were missing the point or what in the world was going on. So to have an intense emotional response is normal. Where we start to worry about it is when it goes on for too long and interferes with someone's ability to cope. So when people are newly diagnosed, we expect them to be anxious, to be a bit disorganized. That's one of the symptoms, actually, of grieving is disorganization because suddenly your life has changed. And you don't know what's going on and you don't know where things are. So it's normal to be confused and disorganized and to not be sleeping well and to be pretty anxious, um, to be pretty traumatized. So although that's normal and expected, it's still we still might choose to treat it at that time because even though, you know, um, nausea and vomiting can be a symptom of pregnancy, but if it goes on for too long, you still treat it. It's a normal part of pregnancy and it still requires treatment. Absolutely, Pat. And if I may interject here, there are three questions that are coming in the poll. And these three questions actually give me the perfect excuse to show you the slide about the MRI of the brain. Uh, which I mean, <laughs> which I'm, neurologists have to do. I have to. It's stronger than my, me. I, but, but anyway, so it's, those are great questions. The question has to do, so I had MS for many years. And I, that MS, uh, the, the, uh, depression has also been present for many years. And depression has been controlled in the past with whatever intervention I had, medications. But somehow that stopped and it's no longer controlled anymore. So what is changing? Is my disease changing? Is my brain changing? And let me tell, let me show you this slide. This is a study that was done not too long ago looking at a functional MRI. So a functional MRI is rather than taking pictures of your brain, is taking pictures and having an, an, an idea of what the brain is actually doing. So going back to the hardware and the software, not only you take a picture of the hardware, the structure of the brain, but you actually look at the software, how the brain is actually working. So it's a wonderful tool. It's available in research. And, and that MRI study showed that patients with MS, they have to use more brain to compensate for traumatic events. And they could be as simple as seeing a picture of somebody crying. So when anybody sees a picture of somebody crying, there is an emotional response that our brain will have. Well, guess what? MS patients, and those were very young, newly diagnosed MS patients that did not have any interventions yet with medications. They had an over-response to that picture, seeing somebody crying, and that resulted in activating more neurons, more, more brain to actually deal with that. So if you put this study with other studies that have shown that, for example, finger tapping, moving a finger, 
MS patients have to recruit more neurons to do that simple task. MS patients are going constantly through this additional stress, this additional need to recruit more neurons to perform a simple task. And as you can imagine, if you do that for many, many, many years, it's going to time, come a point in which your brain is no longer able to compensate as well as it was in the past. If you add that normal aging, that will be the perfect example of how to explain that, you know, I was able to control things in the past, but now I can't, and I need more interventions. So hopefully this, this, this slide and this study uh, help uh, all of us understand what is happening with somebody with MS. That's why it's important as soon as possible to identify problems and try to intervene to help patients don't have the need to recruit more neurons to do things that they don't have to. So I'm going to stop tapping my fingers, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not wasting them. I wanted to just touch briefly on why I think sometimes people don't recognize depression when they've had MS for a while. That I think when, and I think Anne Marie touched on it, uh, when you're in a sort of a chronic phase of dealing with MS and you're through the diagnosis and you're managing this okay and you've figured out how to kind of get things done. Um, but I've had people come into my office and say, I don't, I, you know, I'm doing really well. It's going okay. I don't know why I'm so depressed. And the point that I want to make is that the thing that people don't consider about MS is that it's just going to take more energy to live with this. It doesn't take a whole lot more energy, but if, if, if living every day on Earth costs you X, then living every day on Earth is gonna, with MS is going to cost you a little bit more. And people get worn out dealing with it. And I think that's why when people have had this for a while, the symptoms of depression that I look for tend to be just what Anne-Marie said, irritability and sleep disturbance. And that's the way it tends to manifest. So um, that's another reason that it gets un unrecognized and undiagnosed. So in terms of thinking about, we've talked about how it looks, what do you do about it? Um, and, and how are interventions helpful? And one of the big interventions that I think is helpful, particularly when people are newly diagnosed, is getting good information about MS. A lot of times people are terrified about the disease. They have a lot of notions about what it is and what it's going to look like. And it depends on how they're diagnosed. Sometimes um, people are diagnosed in a way that actually makes it much easier to deal with a diagnosis. If they were, I had a patient one time whose neurologist said, well, if we're lucky, this is going to be MS. If we're not lucky, it's going to be something really serious. So she was relieved to get an MS diagnosis. That's not always the case for people. But when, when people have good information about the disease and realize that they didn't just get diagnosed with the Black Death, that this is a manageable thing and, and um, we have a lot of ways to manage it and treat it, that's really helpful. But a lot of times people don't get good information and good education about MS when they get diagnosed and they spend a whole long time um, in a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, I have a friend who was um, had a few symptoms and uh, was diagnosed by a doctor who then at the same time followed it up with, and I'm retiring so you'll have to find someone else. And she hadn't had an MRI yet and she didn't trust the diagnosis, and yet she was walked out absolutely terrified, felt that the medical profession had failed her, was all, had been isolating herself for months because of the symptoms she was having, and had moved here from Hawaii, so her friends and family weren't nearby anyway, but she was even still isolating herself from communications with her parents. So she had no friend network, no family network, was scared to tell anyone at work that she was having any symptoms, and this doctor pretty much just shut the door in her face. And, um, you know, luckily, we got connected. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's a perfect example of what to do now, right? Once you had a diagnosis of depression, when, when somebody told you, well, you have a mood disorder, what's next? And, and probably before we go into medications, uh, we need to talk about lifestyle modifications and strategies that anybody can do without a prescription, which had to do create your network. So people ask me 
sometimes why would psychotherapy be helpful when you were dealing with MS? Because I've had many people say to me, what are you going to change? I'm still going to have MS. Well, psychotherapy can be helpful because I think it can help you sort through how you're feeling about things. It can give you a place to feel them. It can help you think about some strategies. If you, particularly if you're working with someone who's familiar with chronic illness and familiar with MS, it can kind of point you in directions that perhaps you need to go. So it can be a place to sort out, a safe place to sort out what you're feeling and try and put things in pile and piles and make sense out of what's going on. And that's, that's great. And, and I will, uh, as the questions come, I will try to address them. So this question ha is very important. So we talked about the cognitive impact of depression, and the question has to do with how can you distinguish the difference between cognitive problems that are just primarily due to MS versus the pseudo-dementia or pseudo-cognitive problems that are is a consequence of depression, um, independent of the cognitive impact of MS. And that's very difficult to distinguish sometimes in the clinic, and I can imagine for patients, very difficult to understand what is happening. Usually cognitive problems that are associated with depression tend to come in a combo with other things, uh, decreased energy, decreased appetite, as we mentioned before, fatigue, this sense of hopelessness, sense of I don't want to do things. And in addition, by the way, my memory is not working well. And when you start asking patients more, it's actually not memory, it's attention. So they still remember their social security number, they still remember um, their home address and cell phone, but if somebody's talking to them, two minutes later they don't remember what, what this, uh, this person said. And that's not a problem of retrieval of information, which is memory problem. It's a problem of input. The information is not getting to the brain because the brain is just in, in complete stress. So it's more attention problems than memory problems. Whereas cognitive dysfunction in MS, as the disease itself will impact, has to do more with this memory problem in which no matter how much attention you put in something, two minutes later you will not remember. And it's usually independent of the sense of uh, hopelessness or, or sadness that patients may, may experience. Because yeah, when people are really stressed and distracted and, and really fearful about the future and the diagnosis, they're just not paying attention. Exactly. So it's more attention than, than memory. So just to move on with the... Um, with the slides, so Pat is going to cover uh, some more uh, details. No, we don't need to go over that. No, there. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you? We're going to run out of time, so why don't we move on? To okay. The so, what can you do besides medications? Well, that's something that is usually the last step. So, we, we talked about creating your network, uh, find people and, and resources that will work for you. I mean, you have to be in charge of that. You have to be uh, taking the lead on helping yourself, but also you will need help. So those are just some bullet points that try to uh, help people in terms of what to do. And, and the first bullet point doesn't mean to be seen as a derogative bullet point. It's just don't expect much, too much about yourself means set up realistic expectations and start one step at a time. Start with small goals that you can easily accomplish and then move on to the next. And when we talk about don't expect too much of yourself, when we talk about mood disorders, Sometimes I think people often think about depression as something that they ought to be able to get over, that somehow it's a choice. And it's not a choice, really. So when, when you not expecting too much of yourself is, I think, also to realize that depression isn't really a mood disorder. It's not something that you can turn off. There's something that you can treat, and there are things that you can do to manage them, and there are important things that you need to do to manage them. But it's not the sort of thing where you can just say, oh, I'm just, this is just self-pity and I'm done. I, I think sometimes it, there is that, but then it doesn't go on forever. Oh. And I, I, I would agree, because I think at least societally in my years of living, you know, people can say, oh, you're in such a bad mood. And it, that kind of implies, oh, it's something I sh you should be able to change because you're in a bad mood. And, and I think this, this is quite different. Um, there are times when my husband might say to me, um, you know, you're really irritable, and I might say, you're right. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm in this, and I'm this, and I'm sorry, but I am because I'm, I'm you know, I just don't have what I used to have, and, and being able to 
not beat myself up for that and recognizing that that's what it is now <coughs> because I yeah and and then I I take my nap and even you know so I'm I'm a, on antidepressants I take my naps and I still get tired and worn out but it's a new normal that I can manage and he recognizes it too and he can tell when I need a nap and he often will say don't you need to go lay down? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be miserable, and I'm going to be miserable too tonight. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's so important to also include your network, right? It's not just a, a right. battle that you're fighting yourself. If you include people around you, they not only feel more helpful to yourself, but actually they are helpful. If they don't know what's happening, they they could be on the way, and and then everybody suffers. So the the, the other bullet points is kind of like common sense, but of course things like alcohol, poor sleep. Will, will negatively impact the way you feel. Exercise is such a powerful, positive uh, intervention for, for depression and all many, many mood disorders. Um, and of course, diet. So try to sleep well. Uh, seek emotional support from your network. Uh, try to look at the positive side. I mean, this is, again, it makes sense, but sometimes for all of us, we, we find difficulties getting there. And, and try to modify your schedule and set realistic goals. I wanted to touch on something that the two, the two of you said uh, about including your network mm -hmm. in this conversation. If you don't allow yourself to have an emotional response to this and you don't allow yourself to be stressed and depressed about what's happened and you can't talk to other people about it, they're not going to know what's going on with you. And if they don't know what's going on with you, they're not going to be helpful. Your doctor's not going to be helpful either if you don't tell your doctor what's going on with you. So the willingness and ability to be able to communicate with other people is critically important. And I, um, I have a couple of thoughts on that as well. Um, as I developed my group of MS friends, um, we are all on different ends of the spectrum on every aspect of MS um, and how we deal with it. And our symptoms are different and we've had it for different amounts of time. Um, I have one friend who won't say MS. Um, that's, she's, she talks to no one about it except us. And it, it's very difficult for, for her as a result, and she really feels like we're a lifeline. Um, she has said to me that she's working on trying to be able to talk about it more. So having just even our group is one leg of her support system, and and hopefully, you know, sh she will uh, she will reach out and um, and get others to help. The other thing, so that, that's one end of the spectrum. For me, when I got diagnosed, I, I worked for 23 years, <laughs> 60 plus hours a week more often than not, and um, all of a sudden I wasn't going to be working. And, and secondly, you weren't going to see me for a few hours every day. So if you ever wanted to, so if, if I met someone who didn't know me as a, a working person and all of a sudden now I'm a mom with a two-year-old and I'm a stay-at-home mom, if they wanted to schedule anything with me, I simply couldn't do it between the hours of, you know, 1 and 3.30. And so it became clear to me right away, I don't know how I live my life without letting people know that I have MS. Not that MS defines me in any way, it's that it's part of me now, and resting is one of the highest priorities in my life right now. My husband has said those words, that the most important thing to all of us is your health for our family. And so you rest when you need to rest. Well, I just realized that if I was going to be close to other people, and ha we moved two years ago and I got diagnosed six years ago, so as we moved to a new neighborhood, I met all these new people, and I don't know how I could not let them know and still be myself without me feeling like I was hiding something 
and, and I'd have to make excuses. And I had already done that pre-diagnosis for nine months and did not like it at all. And so I've had several of my new neighbors now, three or four of them, that have said, you know what, it takes a village and you let us know if you want us to take your daughter so you can rest. Some of them even text me before my nap time and say, do, do, you know, does your daughter want to come over and, and play while you take a nap? And so I think that people, many people, most people I like to think are compassionate people and um, want to understand and support those of us that are living with this. And that, that's actually beautiful and inspires me to think about the brain again. And we talked about when the brain suffers, what, what is the normal response of the brain? To recruit more neurons to do the same things that it's supposed to be doing. Well, maybe we should look at our brain and learn from that. So when we suffer, one of the normal responses will be, let, let's recruit a network of people. Let's, let's create a new network and so I can accomplish my goal, which is the ultimate outcome, right? I mean, that doesn't matter how much of that uh, goal you did yourself versus how much of that you know, people around you help. help. But, but it's as important as, as trying to accomplish the goals is also learn how to. And some, that's, it. that's in a process that will never stop and is constantly changing. MS patients go through constant change. Their brain is changing. Diseases uh, modifying therapies are changing. So uh, depression is not a one-time diagnosis that will be treated with one intervention. Over the lifespan of a patient, depression change and the interventions and the compensation that we do uh, to that it also should be flexible and change. Yeah, I think there was a, I think there was a question that came up about how does depression change over the, the life of the disease, and I think I can't say exactly how it changes, but I think it does change for people because I think they come to understand the disease differently and who they are differently. I mean, we all adjust to how we change over time, and I think one of the things, Anne-Marie, that you've said is that you sort of had to formulate a new image of who you were and how this was going to work and, and put things, reconstruct yourself, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I think it can change. I think an important part, though, of being able to change it is to be able to talk about it. One of the big problems that I see that people have is isolation, and one of the big problems with a chronic illness generally is that it can isolate people. My experience in talking to people over the years is that when they try and talk to other people who don't know much about MS, it can be very difficult, and it doesn't go very well. So there's a huge value in finding people like your support system, um, Anne-Marie, who do understand what you're talking about. And so when you say something about fatigue, they don't say, yeah, I'm tired too. I'd love to take a nap every day like you do. Yeah, yeah. Because um, that just makes it more isolating. And when people are really isolated, they just get disconnected. And you just feel like you're sort of floating out there in space. And that can be, make it really difficult to figure out who you are and, and rework yourself. And related to that, so it's perfect, a, a very good point. So who, who you choose as your team, well, uh, make sure that also your team is educated in what is happening to you. And, and that becomes a very synerg synergistic uh, relationship in which the more you know, the more they know, the more they can help you as well. Um, so I think we have a few more minutes left, but I, I have to just, to be complete, put a slide on medications, <laughs> even though I want to emphasize one more time that it's not the only intervention. It should not be sometimes the first intervention. Uh, there are so many things that we can do and patients can do to help themselves that is independent of the medication, the, the drug of choice. But as Anne-Marie pointed out, medications actually help. And that has to do with the biology of depression in MS. It's not uh, something that you create in your head. It's, it's part of the disease process. And there are a, 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 a neurotransmitters in the brain, we call them the happy neurotransmitters, that actually are affected with the mess, it's part of the disease. And what these medications do is work with them to try to increase the ones that we need and decrease the ones that we don't. Um, but as important as medications is actually your network and doing things that actually cause pleasure to you and, and, and try to uh, you know, recreate your, your life around this new reality. 
So can, I will not I, go into detail. Can I just jump in really quickly? I think that um, I know we've touched on exercise, but I would agree. And even there are days that um, I kind of have my day when I wake up of how I'm feeling. Do I have enough energy to uh, work out on an, an exercise machine, or do I only have energy to take the dog for a walk? Um, but whatever it is, and I'm certainly not perfect, and I don't do it all the time, but I try to, that's the kind of question I ask myself. Even if I can't exercise more, at least try to get outside. Getting outside, I think, is really good uh, for your your um, mood and um, and trying to get some exercise, even if it's just walking the dog. Okay, so I have to jump in here, too. I'm a psychotherapy person, and I believe in people talking about stuff. That said... I'm a real believer in medication, and here's why. Because when people are really worn out, as people get when they're struggling with all of this stuff, they are so worn out sometimes that they can't even think about what to do next. They can just put one foot in front of the other. They are so spent. And I think one of the things that medication can do is that it can kind of shore them up a little bit. It can... Okay. It can um, stop the leak, if you will, so that they have a little bit more energy to even then begin to contemplate what, how they want to change things, what they might change, and how they might do it. So I don't think medications are the only answer, mm -hmm. but there is no shame Absolutely. in using medication, and they can, and I don't think you have to wait until you're completely worn out and then until you've tried everything else on the planet before you have a conversation with your doctor about it. So I think it's, I think people are different about that and different about what they want to do, but there is, I think, a really important place for medication. Absolutely, and I, I agree. It's, it's just, uh, it's always good to have a conversation on the behavior behind the medication and uh, to try to avoid thinking, well, if I just take this pill, everything will get solved. And, and, and I think we all agree here that it just takes, an army takes a lot of interventions to try to break that cycle. But I agree that the medications have a role and a very important role. Yeah, and sometimes there are a good place to start so you can access your other resources. And I think there was a question about who prescribes medication. If you are thinking, if you're struggling with depression, um, who, who, if you have a multiple caregivers, who do you talk to about this? Um, I think I'd let you answer that. So, but I, my experience is um, different neurologists have a different comfort level in dealing with medication and primary care doctors um, often prescribe antidepressant medications and for more complex things I think psychiatrists are an important resource as well. Absolutely, yeah. So with neurologists, we, we are familiar actually most of the board certified neurologists, we have to take board certification in psychiatry as well. So uh, we, we have background and education in, in, in depression and how to treat that. So that will be a very reasonable first a resource to seek. However, when things get too complex, um, very often we, uh, we get a second opinion with one of our colleagues in psychiatry, particularly when we have to start mixing therapies and adding more than two antidepressants. Uh, that sometimes gets um, uh, confusing, and we prefer to have more team members uh, to help patients. Um, so I think we're coming to the end of the presentation. This is just a summary of the importance, and hopefully we, we portray that in our presentation, the importance of recognizing depression early, uh, particularly because it's very common, and there are many flavors that depression can present. So there is a last question here. Um, so we are trying to understand how much we impact it positively uh, hopefully a positive impact in your understanding and also your behavior around depression. So we would like the audience, if possible, to choose uh, the most appropriate answer. You can, again, choose more than one of these, these questions. And hopefully nobody will choose no change, but I don't mean to... Uh, uh, <laughs> All right, so we are a little bit over half of the audience, uh, so I'm going to close the poll. And we have, good, so we are uh, reaching an 83% of uh, more awareness, which is perfect. And we have a 66% of being able to share things with the, the, your network, as well as dis uh, discuss this with your doctors. 
So with this, we would like to conclude the act of formal presentation, and we will try to address most, if not all, of the questions that have been coming. So the first one has to do with how is depression or symptom of a man. So I think we, we talked about the biology behind depression, and again, and Marie mentioned different type of responses to the disease itself. It's not only a response that is depending on how you are, but also it's part of the disease process. It's nothing that you're doing to yourself. Is something that MS is doing to you, and it's important to recognize the difference. The actual physical lesions in the brain and the chemical reactions that cause those and that those cause are part of what changes the neurochemistry in your brain and can contribu contribute to depression. So it's a physiological thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's not, again, a response that you are doing, that you're just getting the wrong, the wrong reaction to things is part of your brain disease, is part of the, the, uh, the, the network that we talked before, the software, the way the brain works, that is, uh, is going to be mandated by uh, the, the, the hardware. So if you have lesions in, in the interrupt in certain pathways, the way the brain is going to respond to certain things, independent of your thoughts, is going to be dysfunctional, and that will result in mood disorders. And I think it's really important to stress that you have that kind of depression that you can have from MS. You can have a reaction to medications because there are medications, for example, that are sedating and that can contribute to depression. Um, some of the interferons can contribute to depression, or we think that they can. Um, so you can have depression from that as well, and then you can have the adjustment, the reaction to dealing with all of the changes and the grief and the loss and the, the confusion and everything else that goes along with living with a chronic disease and not being able to have the energy that you want and be able to do the things that you want. So you can have depression coming from multiple directions yep. at any given time. Absolutely. Another question has to do with depression the only mood disorder associated with a mess, and of course not. We tried to briefly cover that in one slide in which we, we uh, showed other examples of mood disorders. Um, anxiety, that will be a very common mood disorder that sometimes comes with depression and, and sometimes when things are are uh, very extreme in terms of um, uh, the, the occurrence of anxiety with depression. Uh, doctors like to call that bipolar disorders, and there are different names that we use. Um, uh, seasonal affective disorders as well. So there are many, many examples of mood disorders in, in MS. So hopefully this presentation, which was primarily focused on depression, will also help to lower the threshold in when people recognize that something is not working right. And regardless, again, of the label that we use, uh, there are always interventions that we can try to help ultimately improve quality of life. And I, I think for, um, I have a personal example of where it, it is, that it is all related and tied together. Um, when I went through nine months of trying to get diagnosed, um, I had an anxiety attack, which I'd never had before, but when I had it, I thought, this is different. <laughs> My heart is racing, and um, I'm supposed to be sleeping, and I'm wide awake. And I, you know, it, it because I was scared to death about what was going on with me and my body and my health and my mind. Everything was falling apart. And so the the challenge, though, was I didn't have a diagnosis yet. <laughs> So I was having an anxiety attack about my health and not knowing what was wrong with my health. And, um, you know, it, it, perhaps that contributed to me being open to getting help pretty early after my diagnosis. I think people often don't recognize that there can be such a thing as an agitated depression. So sometimes when people are depressed, they don't look slowed down. It's not the typical notion of someone lying on the couch weeping. They're running around at high speed, being incredibly busy and irritable. Um, depression can have so many faces. I don't think it matters so much what we call it. What matters is that we recognize it and give it the attention it deserves. Absolutely. And the last question we have here, it's a very challenging question to answer, which has to do when should we stop the medication? Let's say that we found this intervention that is helping patients with MS. And, and that usually comes out of a stigma that we all have in terms of oh, when you start something, you can stop it. And that's not true. So there are ways that we can try to stop medications. 
um, there are many many strategies that we can try. And Marie explained her personal example when when she was feeling better and she tried to stop the medication and she suffered the consequences. In general, things are reversible. Whether we start something or we stop something, we can always modify the course. Um, I always try to keep things simple, and, and there's a common principle in medicine which has to do with don't fix what ain't broken. <laughs> so if things are working well, and there's a minimal impact, whether it's on safety or on quality of life due to the interventions, maybe it might be prudent to keep doing the things that are working. However, it's always good to discuss with your doctors when to start, when to stop medications. And, um, and I'll also mention um, that not, not only is it in my um, character to want to not be on medication and see if I could um, not be on the antidepressant and see how I could handle life, um, but the, what, the medication I was on also affected my sex life. And that was something that affects my husband and me. And, and so it was something that, you know, I kind of wanted to see what it was like to go off um, from that perspective as well. And um, it's also something that I was able to talk to my doctor about, do I want to try a different one or do I want to stay on this one? And um, I think it's, none of this is really simple and straightforward and it goes back to you just need help from all different people mm -hmm. <laughs> to, um, to try to kind of fine tune or I call it optimizing my quality of life. You know, it's it's not, there's no roadmap of how to do it, um, but there's lots of areas of support and help. And I think you, if, if you don't have the um, energy to do it, turn to someone who can help you do it and help you try to optimize your quality of life. And it, it took me three years, <laughs> I think, to um, really feel like I was in a, a really the best place I could be at that time. Another point just to consider when you think about stopping uh, an antidepressant medication is to remember that mood disorders come from different places, so they can come from the disease, they can come from your reaction to the disease. And so one of those may change. You may actually get much more comfortable and confident about dealing with your disease and reorganize your sense of self, and that's great. That doesn't do anything about the impact of the disease on your brain itself. So that piece of the depression can absolutely. still be residual. And absolutely. that's what you take taking the medication for, yeah, not for absolutely. the weakness of your character. Absolutely. Um, so I think it's just a really important thing to monitor and discuss with your doctor and try and if it works, it works, if it done, it done. Yep, absolutely. So there's a question about mania and, and I'm, I'm glad that's been asked because that's another mood disorder that is commonly, not that common, but is possibly seen in MS patients. And that's part of the spectrum of bipolar disorders, right? When, when you have both ends of the spectrum, either things being depressed or things being too exaggerated and has to be with the fact that our brain, like any organ in our body, should have some sort of balance system. That's something we call in medicine homeostasis, something that has to be in balance. Whenever you disrupt that balance, things can go either way. Things can go to the area of depression, that as Pat mentioned also, just to complicate matters, you can have a hyperactive type of response in depression, which is the third patient case that we, we chose for you today which is a type A personality, high achiever person, that the moment you break that balance becomes even worse. It works more, sleep less, becomes irritable. And, and, and sometimes things get to the extreme of mania or hypomania in which the brain cannot stop and it's, it's, it's actually responding in a very abnormal way to hyperactivity of the brain. So that's commonly uh, seen uh, and it's possibly seen in MS and, and also should be recognized and, and it just to, to avoid going into too many details, patients, at least they should recognize when something is wrong. And, and that usually should prompt uh, getting help and seeking help, whether it's from the neurologist, family members, psychotherapists, or other patients, as, as Anne-Marie mentioned, having a support group, that's very important.
So I think we answer uh, most questions. So unless and Marie and Pat, you have a final comment, we are ready to wrap things up. So thank you everybody for uh, staying and listening to us. Thank you for the Rocky Mountain Med Center for organizing this wonderful talk. And this is going to be recorded and available online in case somebody wants to go back and listen again or, or refer to uh, friends or family members to actually listen to this activity.